So thank you for doing this, for being a part of this. I'm convinced that uh, everyone will be inspired by your curiosity um, because the, the truth is everybody has questions. You guys just happen to be brave enough to go first. I don't think we'll ever be able to know, but it's definitely such a mystery. What what was what was that void? Did God come out of that void? Was he before that? God is eternal. So that also ties into what his reason was for creating the earth. What was wrong with just having a void? But I don't think that's for us to know. I think just like how I keep on asking myself how literal is this chapter like did it actually take seven days or does it is it is that like each day represent like a thousand years like they didn't have 24 hour like periods then he lives vicariously through himself do you know his name his blood smells like cologne if, if you know who i'm speaking about just throw it in the chat right now uh his business card says i'll call you Cuba imports cigars from him. Mosquitoes refuse to bite him out of respect. When he goes to a museum, he is allowed to touch the art. He is the most interesting man in the world. What is his name? He'd been in acting his entire life and in his 70s, he was completely broke. He said this about himself. He said, I worked 50 years to be an overnight success. His name, Jonathan Goldsmith, and DeSecchi's beer made him famous. He's the most interesting man in the world. And he's famous for saying, stay thirsty, my friends. Today, we're starting a brand new series about staying curious, my friends. Your curiosity is your velocity. If somebody feels stuck in life personally, professionally, and definitely spiritually, it is attached to their curiosity level. Because when we're curious, we're growing and we're moving forward. Now, Jesus puts it this way. He says in Matthew 7, 7, keep on asking, keep on seeking, keep on knocking. Curiosity. Curiosity has a lot to do with asking questions. When you're curious, you ask a lot of questions. When you're no longer curious, you're just making statements. Jesus asks more than 300 questions in the Bible, trying to get us to be curious because he knows our curiosity it's tied to our spiritual velocity, to our personal, professional, and spiritual growth. That's how we unstuck ourselves. Communion, Passover, the greatest meal in all the Bible always begins with a question. By the youngest person able to ask the question, who is present? Why is this night different from every other night? Curiosity, it is your velocity, it is my velocity. Are you curious? Have you made up your mind about the Bible? Have you like, this is what the Bible says, this is what it means to me, I'm done, Boop. that's it. Or are you still really curious? Do you consider God's word to be deep? Are you too convinced or too unconvinced about God's word? How curious are you? Your curiosity is your velocity, humility is definitely connected to curiosity. People who are humble are curious. People who have pride are just stuck. When you have a lot of pride, you're brittle, you're rigid, you're not soft, you're not, you can't be molded by anything or anyone, including God. But when you're curious, when you're curious, you're humble and you're soft. And God, as the Bible says, is the potter and we are the clay. Apathy in the Bible, according to the book of Revelation, apathy is your enemy and my enemy. And if you're never wrong, you're never growing. Tell me where you have been wrong in the past year. If you haven't been wrong at all, especially as we talk about the Bible today, if you've never been wrong about something here, if this hasn't shown you some area where you can become less wrong, 
then you are not inspired by the truth of God's word. It is those who are continuously becoming less wrong. They recognize apathy as their enemy. Where Jesus says in John 8, the truth will set you free. Where they're constantly growing deeper and deeper and deeper into God's truth. And it's revealing more to them, more truth of them. And they're becoming less and less and less and less wrong. That they are inspired by the living Word of God. Can you tell me where you've been less wrong in the last year about the Bible in some way, shape, or fashion? Are you too convinced of the Bible? Or are you too unconvinced of the Bible? Keep on seeking, keep on asking, keep on knocking. Show me someone who is in the process of becoming less wrong, and I will show you someone who is in the process of constant growth. Now, let's go to the book of Genesis. Why are we starting with Genesis? Because this is where Jesus started. In Luke 24, he's describing to his disciples who he is and explaining to them, and it says he starts with the law. That's the first five books of the Bible, and the first one is the book of Genesis. If we're going to understand Jesus, then we have to start where he starts, and we're going to start in Genesis 1.1. This is what it says. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. Now, the earth was formless and empty. Darkness was over the surface of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters. And God said, let there be light. And there was light. God saw that the light was good, and he separated the light from the darkness. God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. And there was evening, and there was morning the first day. And God said, let there be a vault between the waters to separate water from water. So God made the vault, separated the water under the vault from the water above the vault. And it was so. God called the vault sky, and there was evening, and there was morning the second day. And God said, let the water under the sky be gathered in one place and let dry ground appear. And it was so. God called the dry ground land and the gathered waters he called seas. And God saw that it was good. Then God said, let the land produce vegetation, seed bearing plants and trees on the land that bear fruit with seed in it according to their various kinds. And it was so. The land produced vegetation plants bearing seed according to their kinds and trees bearing fruit with seed in it according to their kinds. And God saw that it was good. And there was evening and there was morning the third day. God is the great separator. You see, according to their kind, he's separating, he's separating, he's separating. So let's go back through this. In the beginning, in the beginning of what? In the beginning of what? What is this actually the beginning of? It is the beginning of everything. Is it the beginning of the universe? We, we have something that theologians call this word ex nihilo. It means out of nothing. Is this ex nihilo creation? Is this the beginning of everything? Is this what we might call the Big Bang? Is this what we might call the beginning of the universe? Is this it? What exactly is this the beginning of? It's interesting that the word create, in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The word create, we have a little clue here. Because in Hebrew, it never means ex nihilo creation. It never means out of, some, out of nothing. So what exactly is going on here in the beginning God created? Is this actually beginning of everything? Or is it talking about something else? The Bible here doesn't seem really interested in the origins, at least at this point. I'm not saying that this does not support ex nihilo, the creation of all things at the very beginning. The Bible supports that. But is this story supporting? Is that what it's trying to grab our attention about? What is it trying to direct our minds towards? Here, as you read through this, everything that you see here in this creation story, we see every day. Trees. Plants, water, sky. There's no mythical creatures. This is very serious. People sometimes say, oh, it's just a, it's just a myth. It's just a myth. You know, we have a low view of myth. They had a very high view of myth when these words were written. But nonetheless, there's nothing mythical. There's not like any flying horses or anything like that. It's all things that we're very familiar with. It talks about darkness, the waters. What what are these waters that are getting separated? What exactly is going on there? Darkness and water to them was something is without form. It represents chaos. And chaos to them represents injustice. Now, we're very familiar with that. Evil, injustice, hurt, 
pain, confusion, everything that is wrong with the world. That is what all of that water, the darkness that is hovering represents. You're familiar with that? I am. Is there something wrong in your life? Is there something wrong in this world? Is there something that you would like to get rid of? Is there something that you're tired of? Is there something that you feel hopeless about? That's what the dark waters represent. And it says, the Spirit of God was hovering over those dark waters. Now, this is interesting. The Hebrew word for spirit is ruach, which means wind. Most people translate it spirit, but it also means wind. The wind is the spirit and the spirit is the wind. It's the wind of God. We see here the wind of God, the ruach of God, hovering over those chaotic waters that represents everything wrong in this world and all the hurt and pain and suffering that you have ever experienced in your life. Anything that has ever troubled you, hurt you, or made you feel hopeless, the spirit of God, the wind of God is hovering over all of that evil. And it says, God begins to speak. He speaks the word. The word is the wind. The spirit is the word. And he speaks and the wind begins to blow. If you fast forward into the book of Genesis, you see that God breathes the breath of life into Adam. And he inspirits him. He inspires him. He comes alive. Later on, we're going to get to the story of Noah. And we're told after the waters were released on the earth and chaos broke out and pain and suffering and death just poured forth so much suffering. We're told that after that, the wind of God begins to blow. We're told when in the most famous, one of the most famous stories, when the Israelites were suffering slavery when they were being oppressed so badly in being brutalized that God's wind, the Spirit of God, the wind of God blew upon the waters of the sea and separated the sea and they walked through on dry ground. And lastly, in the book of Ezekiel, Ezekiel sees a valley filled of dry, dead bones. And God says to Ezekiel, can these bones live? Ezekiel says, I don't know. And God says, speak. And when he begins to speak the word of God, it says the wind of God begins to blow. And those bones came alive and stood up. The word of God is the wind of God. And so what's happening here? It says the waters are separating. So here we go, everybody. Our lives are filled with chaos. There are things that are completely wrong in this world. You have suffered or you've seen people who have suffered. We all have experienced meaninglessness and hopelessness and hurt and pain in our lives. We all are dealing with that in some level, shape or fashion. And that is represented by the waters the tumultuous waters, but God's word, God's wind begins to blow. And those waters, we're told here, begin to separate. And as they separate, it creates a space. God's word creates a safe space in our lives where his justice and his will is done. Do you need that space? Are you in an evil space? Are you in a hurtful space? Are you in a space where you are in pain about what's been done to you? or in pain by decisions that you made, that you look back and say, that was really foolish, I have hurt myself. One way or another, there's pain, there's a lot of it in this world. And what is being said in this great story in Genesis is not a scientific rendering of what is going on in the world, but it's the wisdom from God, the word of God, the wind of God blowing to create a space. What's being spoken to us here is God is giving us a way out. Not everybody's interested in science, but everybody is interested in a way out of the mess that we constantly find ourselves in. That's what they needed. Their world was in pain and suffering. Now, we've experienced that, haven't we? We've had all kinds of social and political unrest. We've had an epidemic that we're dealing with. We've had personal problems. We have mental health problems. We have financial problems. We, we, we have so many problems. And God is saying, I am ready to blow with my wind, my word, my wisdom. And I'm be, I want to just separate that chaos. And I want to create a space for you with my word. This is what Genesis is about. This is what God is speaking to us. First Corinthians uh, chapter one says this, Christ, the power and the wisdom of God, Christ Jesus, who has become for us wisdom from God. Do you need that safe space? Now, did you notice as I was reading Genesis chapter one, there's evening and there's morning. There's evening, and there's morning. And we have all kinds of questions about this. Like, okay, day one. Now there isn't a sun yet, 
The sun is created on day four. So what exactly is this day? And are there 24 hour days? And if there are seven 24 hour days in creation, like how old is the earth? And wait a minute, I happen to notice that on day seven, the day never came to an end. That's a really long day. That's been going on a really long time. So what exactly is the day? Well, notice it says, there's evening and there's morning. Every day, God starts, he speaks. And when he speaks, he brings light. Psalm 27 says, the Lord is my light and my salvation. He is creating us a way out of the mess that we find ourselves in. And every day, there's more and more and more light. It's evening, darkness, right? And morning, light. And every day, day one, day two, day three, the accumulation of more and more light is coming into the world as God keeps speaking. So every time God speaks and his word goes forth and we understand the wisdom of his word, well, then we create a bigger and bigger and bigger space for light. When I was in high school, my high school, they allowed us our homerooms to take a trip anywhere, anywhere we wanted to go locally or whatever, do whatever we wanted. So we had one guy in our class who said, you know what? I went spelunking in West Virginia. Now, I don't know if you know what spelunking is. I didn't know what spelunking was, but I found out it's you go into a cave and you go in there with these lights and flashlights or whatever, and you just crawl around and you find it was on West Virginia. There's some places to spelunk. Well, we go up here and I can't believe it but the teachers and our homeroom teacher in our class allowed us to be led by a 15 year old teenager who had been in this cave one time and he was led by somebody who was a guide and they just turn us loose, 25 teenagers inside of a cave. Well, we're going in this cave and he's like, this is the way to go and we're crawling, crawling and eventually, you know, we're down on our stomachs and the cave is getting smaller and smaller and smaller until eventually we reach a dead end. And there's like this much room, like the, 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 it's, when I think about it now, I get really claustrophobic. And I remember him, he was all the way up front. He yelled, it's a dead end, turn around. You know how hard it is to turn around? I mean, it's so narrow, you can't turn around. You have to push your way back out on your stomach. When we finally got out of that mess. And then we got lost. And there were some, some, some other guys with us who had separated and they had found the way out. And they said, follow the light. We're like, we can't see your light. They said, turn your light off so that you can see the light and get out. There you go. We all are trying to come up with our own wisdom for the way out. That's the way the world works. We think, I'm gonna figure out my way out of this thing. And God says, you know what? If you would just turn your own wisdom off, your own light off, and you would look at my light, I will show you the way out of the mess. That is what Genesis chapter one is about. It begins this way. Here is the way to get out of the mess that you find yourself in. There's more and there's more and there's more light. And God, in Genesis 1 26, throws a lightning bolt down out of the sky and says, all people are created equal and are created in the very image of God. Those words, everybody, changed the world. Nobody had thought of that before. Nobody had thought about that before. God is saying every single person is equal in his eyes. There's no greater and there's no less. That's where the whole world was made up. You had great people, powerful people, mainly all men at the top. And God says, no, male and female. Doesn't matter who you are, the color of your skin, doesn't matter anything. Everybody's equal and that transformed or began to transform our, that thought that God threw down like that lightning bolt began to change the world. It is absolutely amazing. He said, that's the way out. If you'll follow my way, if you'll adhere to this great principle of the equality of all people, you will begin to get out of the mess, out of the darkness, out of the deep, dark cave that you are in. In Genesis chapter one, God is presenting us a way out. Now, we read it as science, we just do. Every conversation I have about Genesis chapter one, everybody wants to know scientifically what is going on. And here's the thing, they really weren't interested in science. They weren't interested in science at all. They were very interested in wisdom and they were very interested in human nature and they were extremely interested in how they could get out of the mess that they were in. We have needless arguments about the length of days, the light, what is the light, the sun, how can the sun be created on day four and we have plants and trees growing? Can you have things growing without the sun? We have those. We talk about who did, who did Cain marry and who are all these people he's afraid of? Didn't bother them one bit because they weren't looking for science. They were looking for wisdom. They were seeking the wisdom of God. Now I'll stop and say this right here. If 
You didn't see last week's message entitled, Start Here. It is super duper important that you go back and you listen to that message from last week, Start Here, to get the proper framework for understanding what the Bible is trying to communicate to us. Science is telling us how things happen, but wisdom is telling us why things happen. The opening chapters of the Bible aren't telling us what happened so long ago? They're telling us what always happens. And that's why the opening chapters of the Bible are so incredibly important to us today, right here, right now. So it's kind of like going to see a football game. If you go to see a football game at a football stadium here in the United States of America, it's going to be NFL. If you go in England to see a football game, you're going to be watching a soccer game. It's a different game. It's a different set of rules. It's a different framework. And here's the thing that we need to keep in mind. We are highly influenced here in the West by Athens and Aristotle and Greek thinking. And so we view it through that lens. So the first thing we think about when we read the Bible, particularly Genesis chapter one, is we immediately start thinking scientific. We immediately start thinking about days or length of days and Cain and light and all of these questions. Those are the first questions. Those are the biggest questions that always come out of that. But that's not the way Jesus or Jerusalem thinks. This is what I mentioned last week and start here. The literature of Jerusalem and of Jesus is decidedly different from Aristotle, Athens, and Greek thinking. Very, this is what, I wanna go with this. What is broadly recognized is true. What is obviously recognized is true is those are two different literatures looking through two different frameworks and because of there's a different framework, you interpret them differently. It's like American football and British football. Two different games, two different rules. And what is natural to us to read it through Aristotle, Athens, and Greek science was unnatural to them. And even though it's natural to us to read the Bible in a scientific way, it is the most unnatural way for us to read it, to correctly interpret it. So we're gonna have to do something unnatural to read the Bible in the most natural way possible, the way it was written. We have to go back. This is what any great scholar is going to do who's seeking the truth. They're gonna go back and take a look at its historical, cultural context and ask the people who wrote it, what did you mean when you wrote this? That is the best way to come to the truth. What did they mean? We know we have discovered so much. We've known for a long time, but we've discovered so much like the Dead Sea Scrolls, one of the greatest archeological finds in the 20th century. We have learned so much about the ancient Near East and now we have the information for us. So this is what I'd like to take a moment and unpack. Again, wisdom. Jesus Christ is called the wisdom of God. Colossians 2.3 says about Jesus Christ in whom are hidden all the treasures of wisdom. They're hidden. What does that mean? We can't find them? No, it just means it's really deep. It means that you just don't say, okay, I figured it out. No, 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 really deep. That You have to keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking, that you're always on a train trying to figure it out. You're never going to reach the bottom of this pool that we call the Bible. You're always going to be on a quest to understand. It. You're always going to be curious. You're always going to be seeking. It is not shallow. And oftentimes, I know I treated the Bible this way myself. I say, oh, the Bible is deep. It's deep, deep. But I treated it like it was shallow because I treated it like I could get to the point where I'm like, okay, boom, I got it figured out. I got this figured out. I know this part. And I just want to keep studying other little parts. No, no, no. The Bible is radically, radically deep. We need to be careful that we are more influenced by Jesus in Jerusalem and the way we read the Bible and interpret the Bible than we are by Athens and Aristotle. Now, here's one of the things that bothers me. All through my growing up at church, going through Bible college and then going through seminary, nobody brought up to me the context of the ancient Near East. Nobody brought up to me the context of the very people who wrote the Bible. What did they mean when they wrote the Bible? I feel cheated because of that. And I want to come alongside of you because for 20 years, I've been digging into this, trying to figure this out and see if we can't make 
a little more sense of what's going on in the Bible because once we do, it's like drinking out of a fire hose. It's absolutely amazing. All right, Tertullian. Tertullian was a second century theologian. He was the one, he was, well, he was the first greatest Western theologian, just right outside the Bible, right? So the Bible was basically finished in the late first century and Tertullian comes along in the mid second century. And he believed there was a rule of faith. He felt that once you establish what it was, and he wrote his own creed up, which is very similar to the Apostles' Creed. You can look it up. Very similar. Once you came up with those points of the rule of faith, you were done, notice this, seeking. You didn't need to seek anymore. And if you didn't understand the points, it didn't matter. You just needed to believe the points and then cut it out as far as seeking goes because you had arrived. You were on a train that had a destination, and you got there with the set of beliefs, and boom, that was it. Seeking was over. You just need to lock down on what you believe. And that is absolutely great. And it makes sense in our Western thinking. I am inclined. I want to do that. I want to do that. And there's only one big problem with that. It is completely anti-biblical. It completely goes against what Jesus says. Keep asking, keep seeking, keep knocking. You're on a journey on a train to the way that never ends because the pool is so deep, God's word, so deep that you'll never reach it. And you can't say, okay, here is, here's the thing. And theologians say this all, all the time. Bible scholars say this all the time. The Bible does not have a creed. And yet from the moment from Tertullian on, we just let creeds explode. And yet the Bible doesn't have a creed. The Bible doesn't have a systematic theology. The book of Romans, people say, is the closest thing to a systematic theology that we have in all of the Bible, and yet it's not a systematic theology because the Bible is far more interested in conduct than it is in creed. Jesus tells the famous parable. He says, a man has two sons. He says to the two sons, will you go out and work in the field for me? And the one son says, I'll go, but he doesn't go. The second son says, I'm not going, but he goes. Jesus says, who was the obedient son? Conduct and creed. Now, are we more influenced by Athens or Jerusalem? I can give you a very, very clear, tangible point here about how we're more influenced by Athens than we are by the literature of Jerusalem. It's our website. The number one question that we're asked about the Grace Community Church website, trygrace.org, is... I want to see your beliefs page. I want to see that creed. Now, listen, if you've asked for it, don't be embarrassed. I do too. I, I still look, when I look up a church, I look for their belief page. I do it. It's natural. You know why? Because it's natural to us. We're in the West. We are influenced by Aristotelian thinking. That is who we are. It's totally natural. But if we were really to have a Jerusalem mindset, a Jesus mindset, we wouldn't have the beliefs page. We'd have a conduct page because the Bible is interested in what you do. Because in what you do, your conduct, you'll figure out what you really believe. Because what you really believe is what you actually do. But Tertullian was like, no, this set, these beliefs, and you see, you separate it from conduct. In the Bible, that's impossible to do. It's about our conduct. It's about the two sons. It's about who actually treats people and acts in a way that is consistent with the light of God's word. The biblical tradition is we are always in a process. We're always curious. We're always seeking. We're always growing. Apathy is your enemy. We're never lukewarm, as Revelation 3 says. Never be lukewarm. You're always in a process of growing. If you're never wrong, you're never growing. Where have you been wrong in this past year about the Bible. Where are you less wrong? Maybe that's a nicer way to pay it, say it. Where have you been less wrong? If you are too convinced, can you be too convinced about the Bible? If you're too convinced about the Bible, you ignore the amazing contradictions the Bible gives us through wisdom to see the deeper truths of God's word and you'll miss the power. If you're too unconvinced about the Bible, you'll obsess over those contradictions that God has given us through wisdom and you'll miss all the power. And again, friends, God's word, this lightning bolt that came out of the sky in Genesis 1, 26, that God has created all people equal. I want you to think about that. That lightning bolt is a judgment against 
the lie that some people are better than other people. And God is pinning that to the ground in the Magna Carta of humanity. Those words first introduced to us in the pages of the Bible that have reshaped the thinking of this world. They came from the Bible. The equality of all people, that is a thought introduced to us in the pages of the Bible, and it's the greatest thought that humanity has ever had, because as of that time, nobody had ever thought that. And that's why we say this had to come from God, because nobody else would have thought that up but God. Now, Mike Lazaridis. Mike Lazaridis, everybody, was an electronics whiz kid. He created all kinds of gizmos. He started creating them before he even graduated high school. Went to college, started creating stuff. Eventually, he drops out of college, and he creates all these amazing devices. But this one device he created, oh my goodness. Do you know the name of it? If you do, throw it in the chat. He created a device that Oprah said literally changed her life. He created a device that President Obama, when he went into the White House, the Secret Service says, you've got to hand that over. He says, I, I can't. I can't live without this thing. Do you know what that thing was? It was the Blackberry. It was the Blackberry. People used it, right, as a phone. They used it to do their emails. And, and those who work with Mike Lazaridis came and says, look, look, we need to change things. We need to change the keyboard. We need to put it on the screen. And people need to be able to surf the internet, right? And he said, no, 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 the keyboard's everything. And, and nobody needs to use this for anything but email. He's like, no, you're wrong, you're wrong, you're wrong. And they, he fought him down and they begged him and he fought him down. Now iPhone, Steve Jobs, his staff came to him and they said, hey, look, we need to get into the phone market. And Jobs said, as only Steve Jobs could do, just blistered them with a bunch of cuss words, told them they were stupid. He hated phones and he was never getting to the phone business and it would undercut iPods. No way, no way. And he yelled and screamed. But they just kind of kept coming to him and presenting this information. And you know what? Eventually, Steve Jobs, who hated to say this, said, I'm wrong. I'm wrong. He got into the phone market and the rest is history. Apple is the most hip, influential, powerful, and I think they got a trillion dollars in the bank company. Do you want to be BlackBerry or do you want to be Apple? The difference between the two is to know that you're wrong. Over this past year, through COVID and all the terribleness that COVID has brought, I woke up every morning almost inspired because I was learning things about God's word where I realized I was wrong about this. There is more, there's wisdom, particularly in the first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis. We talk about Genesis and we say, oh, this is telling us history. It's telling us science. It's telling us what happened way back when. Maybe that has something to do with me. Maybe it doesn't. And I begin to realize, oh, no, 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 wait a minute. It's not telling me science. It's not telling me history. It's telling me wisdom. And here's the big difference of that. It's telling me human nature. It's telling me about things that are happening right now in my life, right now in my world, about human nature and how I can course correct myself and how I can influence through the light of God's word other people to get out of the mess. So it's either science, history, way back then, not really relevant to me, or it's stuff that's right here, right now. It's not telling us about what happened. It's telling us about what always happens. That is the wisdom of God's word. You want to get out of the mess you're in? Light. God speaks it. His word clears the way. We can be inspired. Now, I need to conclude with this. We're going to discuss a lot of intellectual things from God's word in a framework to look at it the most natural way. We're going to consult you know, the writings of the people who wrote the book, what did they mean when they wrote the book? A lot of intellectual stuff, but we might not really get anywhere because what I have found in my own life and other people's lives is there's a tremendous amount of pain. There's a lot of pain that has happened in our lives. And though we might be presented with some truth and it might make sense, it can't break into that that heart that has become so wounded. So I want to invite you to do this. What's your story? I have a story. It's a very painful story and I've written it down right here. Things that I went through. Now, I've shared this many times. When Grace Community Church started 20 years ago, 
I didn't want to be a pastor anymore, ever, ever again. I was so wounded by people in situations that had something to do or associated with this Bible right here. And because of that, it was hard for the truth of God's word to do anything with this hard, hard heart because of all the pain I'd experienced. So I wanna invite you to do something that I've done. I've written my story here. And I wanna encourage you to write your letter if you'd like, to mail it to the address that you see on the screen right now. And I would like to do, only I am gonna see that letter and if for some reason you don't want me to read that letter, that's okay. Just write, don't read, just destroy. Because I'm gonna destroy my letter in a paper shredder. And at the end of this series, I'm gonna burn all those shreddings and I'm gonna pray over every single story and ask God to please, please heal our wounded hearts. Let's pray. Almighty God, I thank you, Lord, that you give us a way out. But we are reminded here right at the end that there's been a lot of pain. Lord, take our painful stories and bring healing to our hearts so that we can receive and walk in your word of truth and enjoy the light of your salvation. In Christ's name, amen.